Welcome. My name is Joan Urban and I'm the worship associate this morning and part of the team that is streaming the service to you wherever you may be. We are an inclusive congregation that welcomes you as you are, inclusive of all your identities, complexities, and situations. We welcome your whole self, even if it isn't fully assembled, because we recognize that we are all in this together and we are all a work in progress. And this week, we have even welcomed stuffed animals. The service is being posted on our YouTube page so that folks can watch it again later. Please feel free to share it with your friends. And now for our opening affirmation. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humankind in fellowship. For these high purposes do we unite in worship. And now for the chalice lighting. We are gathered here and now. For a moment we've stopped working studying, doing dishes. There are no tasks, no emails, no phone calls. We are gathered to feel closer to each other, to feel closer to ourselves, to feel closer to our deepest inspiration, the stream of life that runs through our body and runs through the whole world. May we be opened to see and hear in each other what our souls want to say. Welcome, welcome to this day, this hour, this place, this body. Together, we will answer a call to love. Together, we will create a thing of great beauty. Together, we will find the sacred in the spaces in between. Together, we will worship. Welcome. So, last night here at the fellowship, we had a sleepover for our stuffed animal friends. And I just thought I'd introduce you to some of the friends who were with us. This was Lammy. Lammy slept a lot. And um, this is Earl. Earl doesn't really like crowds, likes to be alone. And so being together at the sleepover with a lot of other stuffies was a little tough, but Earl was patient and we were patient. And I think Earl had a good time and Earl hung out with Zebra because they kind of have some things in common and it made it easier for them to be together. Owl doesn't say a lot, but when Owl says something, it's usually really interesting. So we like to listen to Owl. Oh, here's Doni. Doni was very good at being a good friend and listening to everybody and telling funny stories. I liked that. And um, Harold, Harold is a hamster, of course, you can tell by the tail. Harold actually was a little shy at first, and then we found out that Harold has a great sense of humor and told lots of silly jokes. Oh, Rufus was a little scared at first when, when Chelsea left him here, but then Rufus went over to Teddy and they had a good talk, and Rufus found some way to be helpful with everyone else. Whaley is afraid of the dark. So we left nightlights on for Whaley. And Whaley had a good time. Whaley really was the only one who liked the anchovies on their pizza. Oh, and here is our sweet little kitty. This little kitty had a very good time. He had to be patient with Rufus because sometimes Cheddar is afraid of dogs. So we made sure that Rufus and Cheddar knew how to talk to each other and be patient with each other. They were good friends by the end of the sleepover. And little bear, little bear, little bear stayed really close to big bear. 
because Little Bear wasn't quite sure what to expect. And Little Bear and Big Bear are good friends already. And so then Big Bear, Teddy, asked Little Bear to go and spend some time with Babe. They're about the same size. And actually, as time went on, they got to know each other. I think they're gonna be really good friends now. And <clears throat> my Teddy is here, but so is my naked mole rat, because I love naked mole rats. They're naked and they're mole rats. And mole rats are a little scary because mole rats really like to be in colonies of other mole rats and there weren't any other mole rats. What was mole rat gonna do without other mole rats? Mole rat talked to Teddy and Teddy introduced mole rat to everybody else and they all said, you can be part of our colony all together. So that's how Naked Mole Rat got comfortable here. And in case any of you are wondering who was in charge of all this, well, our wonderful RE staff put it all together and Teddy was the chaperone, being the mature bear that she is. So we had a great time and there was pizza and popcorn and movies and this morning they all had pancakes for breakfast. And I hope you guys had a good time knowing that your animals were all here with us. So thank you for trusting us with your stuffed animals. I want you to know it was kind of nice having them here because it made me feel like you were here too. I love you so much. I miss you. Have a good week. For the next few months, we'll be taking a moment during each service to learn ideas to help us do the work of learning to be anti-racist. We're starting with introducing the definition and characteristics of white supremacy culture so that we can have a shared vocabulary and ideas to consider. We are drawing upon the works of Robin D'Angelo, Kenneth Jones, and Tema Oku. We'll be posting all of this information in our weekly newsletter. Paternalism. This is related to the thinking that there is only one right way. Within white supremacy culture, decision-making is clear to those with power and unclear to those without it. So that those with power think that they are capable of making decisions for and in the interest of those without power. And so that those with power often don't think it is important or necessary to understand the viewpoint or experience of those for whom they are making these decisions. However, those without power understand they do not have it and understand who does. As a result, those without power do not really know how decisions get made and who makes what decisions. And yet, they are completely familiar with the impact that those decisions have on them. Here are some anecdotes. We can make sure that everyone knows and understands who makes what decisions in the organization. We can make sure everyone knows and understands their level of responsibility and authority in the organization. Finally, we can include people who are affected by decisions in the decision-making process. Thank you. And now, if you would like, join me in saying our mission. Our spiritual community lives courage, nurtures wonder, inspires justice, includes all. At this time in our service, we recognize the joys and concerns of our community. This is a candle of joy for all of the children in our congregation who brought in their stuffed animals and all of the adults who helped plan and organize this fun weekend. It's been a delight to see the families represented here, albeit in plush form. And this is a candle of remembrance of all the families who were harmed on September 11th and whose lives have never been the same.
And now I light one final candle for all of our joys and concerns that were not shared, but still felt deeply in our hearts. Most Sundays, I invite people to follow their breath into a meditative place. Today, because we're welcoming our stuffed animal friends, I'd like to invite you to hug and follow your sense of touch into a meditative place. This is loosely based upon a hugging meditation created by the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh. So, go get something or someone to hug. Maybe you can find a pillow or a blanket. Maybe you have a big old sweater or a teddy bear. Maybe you are near a tree and you can hug. Maybe there is a person or a pet nearby that you could hug. If so, please ask their permission first. If they aren't ready to be hugged, go find the pillow, okay? To begin with, I invite you first to pay attention to your arms. Notice where they are strong, maybe where they ache, where they bend or feel stiff. Your arms are very important for hugging, so be sure to bring them along too. Next, pay some attention to whom you will be hugging. Are they larger than you or smaller than you? Will you need to be gentle to make sure that neither of you get hurt? What do you find beautiful about them? Get close enough to actually hug and give thanks for their being present. Take a deep breath to make sure that you are really present too. Now, give them a hug. Feel your arms and their being and both of your stories all together in this moment. Feel the pressure against your chest and notice how the hug might change the way you breathe. You're hugging another mammal can you feel the heat of their body or their heartbeat if you're hugging a tree can you feel the rootedness of the trunk and the fierce protection of the bark if you're hugging a stuffed animal can you feel all of the materials that came together to be soft and comforting As you prepare to end the hug, give thanks one more time. Thanks for your body, thanks for their body. And then one last deep breath. And end. And now Rick Todd will present a musical selection entitled Transit. The march from the turnpike was a murder, but it's never a sin. Friday at five, no one was giving an inch. They squeezed and they edged and they glared. Half of them clearly impaired by rage or exhaustion. The rest were just touchy as hell. Mm -hmm. 
Somewhere near Patterson, everything slow to a crawl. And the all news station was thanking someone for the call. It's a van from St. Agnes's choir. There's a nun now changing her tire. By the time they got by, the temperatures were out of control. So they all hit the gas in the dashboard position, bobbing and weaving. Flashing their high beams, flipping the bird, screaming obscenities, a murderous whore, hell bent on Saturday. So they continue westbound and into the sun. Decorum constraining Mary a one By then it was devil may care Not one even vaguely aware That they'd come all the way To the Delaware water gap their exits how had it happened was it some kind of vortex in they all went bumper to bumper faster and faster no sign of a trooper in they all went like sheep to the slaughter bankers and carpenters doctors and lawyers in they all went Families in minivan Cult Trump Republicans Weekend militiamen Followed the river Followed the bed Between Mitzi and Tammany Into their destiny Lying in ambush Right there before them The angry old son Sister Maria tightened the lugs of despair. She said a quick prayer, put the old van in the ear. Thank God the traffic was light. If she hurried, she might not be late. For the evening's performance, the state penitentiary. She entered the common room, there was her choir, altos and baritones, basses and tenors, car thieves and crack dealers, mobsters and murderers, husbands and sons. Fathers and brothers, so it began in glorious harmony, softly and tenderly, calling for you and me with the inner state white, way off in the distance, and the sun going down through the bars of the prison. They poured out their souls, they poured out their memories. They poured out their hopes for what's left of eternity. The sister Maria, her soul like a prison, for the light of forgiveness on all of their faces.
The reading today is an excerpt from The Miracle of Mindfulness, An Introduction to the Practice of Meditation by Thich Nhat Hanh. People usually consider walking on water or in thin air a miracle, but I think the real miracle is not to walk either on water or in thin air, but to walk on earth. Every day we are engaged in a miracle which we don't even recognize. A blue sky, white clouds, green leaves, the black curious eyes of a child, our own two eyes, all is a miracle. As Unitarian Universalists, we celebrate free thought beyond creed or dogma, but we have also chosen to come together to learn more as a community than we would learn as individuals. We didn't invent this. Community is an essential part of all of the major religions. In Buddhism, there are the three jewels of the Buddha as the teacher, the Dharma of the lessons taught, and the Sangha of the community of learners. In Christianity, there is the community of the church, also known as the body of Christ. And in Judaism, there is the requirement of a minion, 10 adults that must be present for certain religious observations. So, the community has always been important for potlucks, but it's mostly a place for learning from one another. It's why we come together rather than just stay home with the crossword puzzle and another cup of coffee. Today, I'm unpacking our fourth principle. Remember, you use have seven principles. Our fourth principle states that we will affirm and promote a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. This principle was not just thrown together. The words were chosen with respect to the past and as a corrective for the future. We're free, but we must also agree to be responsible to one another. And therein lies a whole lot of tension. But first, a little bit of history. As the Unitarians and Universalists were preparing to consolidate in 1961, they put together a statement of six unifying principles. The whole process might have been done in haste to quickly pave the way for the merger, but um, their principles contained a lot of lofty language and a lot of the masculine gender. There's lots of man and men and brothers, etc. And they included God in the second principle, perhaps to appease the Universalists. But interestingly, even with all of these men and brothers, there was no language about working in community or, or how they would treat one another in community. Hmm. If you haven't had a chance to do so, you should go read the original principles from 1961. They're, they're kind of got a mid-century modern feel. You can find them on the uua.org website. However, by the late 1970s, folks agreed that it was time to update the principles, starting with the gendered language. So in 1984, a group was tasked with the work of updating the principles for their moment. Originally, they were just going to kind of refresh the original six principles, but as they worked, it was agreed that there needed to be a seventh principle that called us all into relationship with the interdependent web of all existence, and that was a big to-do, but I'll tell that story another day. When the folks started working in 1984, they took the sentiments of the original first principle and looked at it carefully. It stated that members would seek to strengthen one another in a free and disciplined search for truth as the foundation of our religious fellowship. Hmm. Not bad, not bad. Let's, let's look at that, okay. To strengthen one another. 
Okay, that sounds kind of vigorous, kind of muscly. Okay, uh, you know, free and disciplined. Oh, discipline. That sounds rigorous, kind of sciencey. And then, hmm, truth is the foundation of our religious fellowship. Okay, that kind of hints at that yeah, community, but notice the word fellowship is not capitalized. It's just general fellowship, not a proper noun, fellowship. But the folks in 1984 knew, they'd seen it happen, knew that an individual supposedly engaged in a free and disciplined search could grow pretty ugly and oppressive, hiding behind the words free and disciplined. Because if a person engages in an independent search, with no expectation that anyone else is allowed to contribute or comment or criticize, a person's thoughts can go into some pretty weird, harmful places. This can lead to free thinkers who freely think up ideas about other people and do things to other people without actually including or talking with those other people. This is how oppression can happen. This is where the problems come, when, when people don't want to learn from others. They want their own freedom of thought, but they interpret anyone else's thoughts as an infringement on their own precious beliefs. These are folks who don't really like hearing about anything other than their own preferred theologies or who actively dismiss or insult anyone or anything other than what they exactly believe. And, and they don't want to have to recognize that other people who hold different truths also have inherent worth and dignity. These people become so free that they become intolerant of any community where they would be expected to be held accountable for their words and their deeds. This is an ugly side effect of the Western Enlightenment's individualism. So, as a corrective, the folks who were updating the principles swapped out the word discipline and inserted the word responsible to remind us that we all can be free, but we must be willing to be responsible for our ideals and responsible to one another. A great idea that harms or ignores your neighbor is not a great idea. That explains the first part of the fourth principle. Now, let's turn to the process of searching for truth and meaning. Back in 1961, the original writers of the principles didn't include meaning, just truth. Truth was apparently enough, um, but meaning was added in 1984, and I'm still not quite sure what was at play here, if it was theology or semantics, but I have a suspicion. In his book, God is not one. The author Stephen Prothero makes the argument that every major religion is centered around a different core problem and then offers a complete solution to that problem. Okay? In Christianity, the problem is that souls are imperiled due to sinfulness and that through accepting Jesus as a God, there will be salvation. In Islam, as Prothero states it, the problem is that humans are arrogant and the solution is submission. According to Confucius, the problem is chaos and the solution is order. Prothero's essential argument is that we cannot simply presume that all religions are answering the same concerns. They have different concerns, different answers. However, he doesn't do much with atheism or nothing to do with humanism, and, and I will simply chalk that up with the fact that he just didn't get close enough to really examine 
the nuances and the concerns. But I was raised in this, so I'm gonna build upon his model and propose that for humanism, the core problem is that we have not fully apprehended truth, and we have yet to understand the meaning of life. And so the solution is to search. Search without ceasing in order maybe to find salvation through questioning. This is how I was raised. And this is what led to a Unitarian Universalist bumper sticker in the 1970s to proudly state to question is the answer. It took a very gentle Quaker named Josh to interrupt some of my certainty with a question. Quakers are very good at asking questions. Maybe they're even better at asking questions than Unitarian Universalists. So uh, Josh asked me, to question is the answer, but what do you do when you come upon an answer? Being young and being very certain, I replied immediately, well then I would question it. But this Quaker's inquiry lodged into my certainty and it still smolders there. Thank you, Josh. Because honestly, this ceaseless searching can become exhausting. It does not allow us the moments of being soul sick or heart weary when we need to simply rest. It doesn't allow us to let up or let go and just float in the river. It, it is an expectation that the individual will have the energy and the agency to conduct their search. Back in 1984, the people who worked on the New Principles fully expected and hoped that their work would also be revisited and revised in years to come on a regular basis. And this is why we've had proposals to change the language in the first principle, and, and there's a proposal to add an eighth principle, and I will talk about this on another day. And this is why, perhaps, in time, we might find a way to include the folks who occasionally rest in their searching, or even who come to a place of contentment and joy, not fully knowing all of the truth or any of the meaning. Perhaps it doesn't have to be a search. Maybe we can use a language about a journey or revelation or co-creation or witness to truth and meaning. Just something that will include a way of being Unitarian Universalist that does not presume restlessness and incompleteness. The change in the language might actually even make room for some of our milder mystics who are already here but tend not to say very much. In the meantime, let's at least recognize the tension in the fourth principle. The commitment to free thought in compassionate, covenantal, responsible relationship to a community. It ain't easy, but it can be so meaningful. May it be so, and blessed be. At this time in our service, the congregation makes its financial offering. If you have made a pledge or would like to make a contribution, you can simply mail it into our office or you can make it online. There's a donate button on our YouTube landing page and on our website, uumarillo.org. On the homepage in the upper right corner, you will find a blue donate button. 
that will take you to a place where you can donate securely through PayPal. If you have made a financial pledge for this year, please keep up your pledge. And now for announcements. While we are not meeting in person, several groups are still meeting. Nothing Much Buddhist Group meets on Mondays at 7.30 p.m. using Zoom. Please check their Facebook group for more information. Our UU Adult Religious Education class meets at 10 a.m. on Sundays using Zoom. Right now, the class is examining the role of UUs in social justice movements. If you are interested in attending this class, please find the link in each week's newsletter. TED Talks on Tuesdays. We have a group that meets every Tuesday to watch a TED Talk and then discuss the ideas. They meet every Tuesday at 11 a.m. And for the months of September and October, they will be focusing on talks related to climate change. You can find the link to their meeting in the newsletter. For more information, please contact Reverend Nell. If you have been participating in the life of the congregation, or simply watching our services online, and are now interested in knowing more about the fellowship or becoming a member, please contact us. We have a, a path to membership program that can meet online or in person. Contact office at uumarillo.org or call our office at 806-355-9351 and leave a message. Now it's time to thank our wonderful tech crew. I want to thank all of the folks who are helping to make this worship service happen. A special thank you to John and Larry for your dedication and care. We could not make this happen without you. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. If you'll join me in spirit of life, Spirit of life, come unto me, sing in my heart all the stirrings of compassion, blow in the wind, rise in the sea, move in the hand, giving life the shade. Justice. Roots hold me close, wings set me free, spirit of life, come to me, come to me. If you'd like, join in the closing words. May the fellowship of this hour touch and move our lives until we come again together. As you head out into this world, please carry these words with you. You are someone's comfort. You are someone's challenge. You are someone's change. You are beloved and you belong. Go in peace.